Hi, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Akane Sano. I'm uh, assistant professor at the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering here at Rice University. And so the, for the next 30 minutes, I'm going to talk about human data set. And hopefully this will give you some information before we are diving into the next panel about uh, human performance and etc. So today I'm going to talk about something related to everyone here. So I have been doing research about like mental health, stress, sleep, and performance, cognitive ability, especially using mobile and wearable devices. So let's start uh, with this graph. So this graph gives you how our well-being can be changing over time if we have a lot of stress. So a lot of people can be positive at the beginning. However, if we have a lot of stress, some people um, their well-being can be declining like this. However, that's not everyone, and some people, are, fortunately, they can stay healthy. So what we are trying to do uh, for our research is, so because if people are reaching this point, it's really, it might be too late, because they might see their doctors, they might have to take uh, medication, etc. So what we want to do here is, we want to detect whether before they are declining their well-being, then we, we want to provide some like, feedback, personalized suggestion, so that they can stay healthy, like do people. And one of the biggest interest for me is a mental health, for example, depression. So we have the number of depressed people increasing over and over in time, and so that uh, we can provide some intelligent, personalized intervention uh, so that they can, people can stay healthy like blue people. So our study target an active college student, also office workers, like us. However, you know, we might be relatively healthy, but we have some issues, right? For example, in our data set, a lot of people, a lot of college students, maybe at here at Rice as well, and office workers, they are very stressed every day, and they could have very low mental health. Um, our study also target um, severely, uh, severe mental health patients, such as schizophrenia patients. Also, our new study target shift workers and people with social jet lag. And in our study, we leverage multimodal sensors to capture various kinds of human behaviors, uh, physiological signals, and also personality traits. Because all these kind of things are related to our health and well-being. So using like, wearable sensors and mobile phones, we capture like, physiological signals, behavioral signals, and environmental signals, as well as social interaction in our daily life setting and to see what kind of factors are influencing our health and well-being. So recently, we have a lot of wearable and mobile devices on the market. So almost every week or every, uh, every month, we might see new, new uh, product coming up. Then relatively, it's getting relatively easier for us, for us researchers, maybe for consumer um, people to get some data about our behavior, like sleep, activity, and physiological signals like heart rate. However, it's still very challenging to understand what's happening, uh, the data itself, and how can we leverage that kind of very rich data set for our health and well-being. So since 2013, we have been running this snapshot study to study like health, uh, to study sleep network affect performance, stress, and health using objective techniques. And this project has been uh, funded by National Institute of Health. And in this study, we measure uh, various things using like wearable and mobile sensors, also with some laboratory measurement to capture uh, like sleep, physical activity, light exposure, and autonomous stress nervous activity as well as our phone usage that can give us how many phone calls we are making every day, how many people we are connected over uh, phone call, email, SMS. 
And using this kind of data set, we have been working on developing machine learning model to predict how people, how we will be feeling in the future. And we also working on to develop some intervention model to provide some suggestions to, uh, to help people reduce stress and improve well-being. So we have been running this kind of human study for a long time, but it's not that easy to get data from human itself because uh, people are not that people might not be that engaged in the study, even though we are paying some money to uh, motivate people. And sometimes our sensors and devices can be broken during the study. So we have to really care about the status of the study, whether our, our data is coming in with a cleaner condition or uh, any sensors might be broken or not. So in our study, we develop automatic uh, data quality checking system. Also, we also develop some automatic notification so that uh, we can automatically send our, uh, to our participant that something might be wrong in the study, as well as we study investigator can also track what's going on in the study as well. So in the study, we are using this kind of wearable sensors to capture physiological signals. And as you can imagine, we are measuring physiological signals and behavioral signals outside the laboratory setting. So that means people are like walking, running, jogging, or anything they want to do. So the data can be very, very noisy. So we have to figure out what kind of, which portion of the data is clean and which portion of the data is uh, dirty or clean. So for that purpose, uh, we develop some machine learning model to identify uh, which part of the data, physiological data is clean and which part of the data is not clean. So this is an example of skin conductance, which is a micro sweat we can measure from our skin and which is an index of our sympathetic nervous system. Also, another issue we have a lot in our study is uh, sometimes we have a lot of missing data because sometimes the, the sensors can be broken or sometimes our participants forget filling out surveys, wear sensors. So this is an example how we tackle with this kind of problem. And we use deep learning method called um, autoencoder to reverse engineer some of the missing data uh, with some existing data set. So next time we're gonna talk about how we analyze this kind of ambulatory human data set, especially for mood, stress analysis, and prediction. So this left panel, uh, this gives you 30 days of self-reported like happiness, uh, calmness, alertness, energy level, and health level. So this is a grand average of like, about 50 participants. And we can see some trends like on the weekends, like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, people are happier because uh, in this case, our participants are college students. So they don't have to go to school, you know, they might have to still do homework, but they can relax and hang out with their friends. Then I wanna give you another example on the right panel. And this is another data from one of the participants in our study. And you can see a lot of difference between left and right. And on the right side, we see a lot of ups and downs in the data. And actually, this is the data from one of our participants in the study who unfortunately hospitalized during the study uh, due to the mental health issue. So if we consider the average mood, so mood here I mean like sadness or happiness, like over 30 days, and y-axis is a mood variability, then we can see this kind of trend. Some people are uh, higher average mood, and some people have so-so, and some people have low mood. And we can see this kind of trend. That means uh, people with sad mood have higher variability in their mood. And next, um, one of our biggest interests in our study is also 
understanding how sleep behaviors influence our health and well-being. And since we are running like 30 days, or even recently we are running even longer studies, like three months and four months, so we can capture how people's sleep behavior affect health and well-being. And this panel shows you uh, these black boxes. These are when people are sleeping. And x-axis is a time from midnight to the midnight to the next day. So you can see like from day one to day 30 how people are sleeping. And this left panel is a regular sleepers. That means this person has a, almost the same bedtime and wake time almost the same time, like every day. However, on the right panel, this is a regular sleepers. That means um, you can see um, very irregular sleep patterns. And sometimes this person has naps during daytime. And how do these two groups, um, these groups' sleep behavior affect like, health and well-being? So in this analysis, um, so we found that the irregular sleepers have statistically lower mental health, also morning happiness, alertness, sorry, alertness and energy level. And we also control like gender, sleep duration, and stress level at the beginning of the study. So this, this uh, results might tell you that you might want to be a regular sleep, regular sleep for every day. And then another interest we are having is, again, uh, as I told you before, we are interested in whether we, are, we can predict how people will be feeling in the future so that if people are, uh, if people have declining mental health, we want to intervene them in the early stage. So our question is, can we predict people's mood and stress tomorrow or in the future using up to today's data? <coughs> so in this uh, data set, we have various kind of human data set uh, from some surveys, some data comes from wearable sensors that can capture physiological and behavioral signals. And some data comes from phone usage. And other data come from mobility patterns from GPS. And the very big challenge we are facing in uh, this kind of problem set is, ideally, we want to develop only one huge big uh, machine learning model that could fit everyone. However, it's very challenging because we have a lot of individual differences in our feeding and our physiology and behavior. For example, you know, what makes us happy or stressed is very different from people to people. For example, uh, I will give you some example using like person A and person B here. And person A is very happy at, at work. He, she really likes working, and she is not happy if she goes to the party. However, this might be a rare case, right? So person B, she doesn't like working, but she's super happy at the party. So we have to figure out how to build machine learning model to adapt to this kind of individual differences. So for this purpose, uh, we, we use uh, this multitask learning. This is a one kind of machine learning models that, uh, that allows us to train machine learning model for each individual, so personalized in, in, uh, machine learning model from the data from that individual <coughs> as well as leveraging the data from other people. So we have been trying different models, and this is just one example using neural network. So we have some shared layers uh, with everyone, and we have also another personalized layer after that, so that we can um, personalize our model as well. And using this kind of multitask learning method, we found that we can improve the prediction accuracy. So, so if you compare to the computer vision or speech uh, machine learning model, this kind of like predicting people's feeling is much, much difficult. Because as I said, yeah, we have a lot of individual differences. Also, we, are, we don't know which data is the best to uh, predict. So here, I, so I'm showing that using the multitask learning, 
we can boost our performance up to like 14 to 19 percent. Also, multitask learning algorithm can give us uh, much richer information about participant because some of the algorithm can automatically give us a cluster information. So we can understand the subset of participant. Uh, for example, some people are uh, spending time outside and that behavior might be related to uh, the, their happy feeling. And some people are uh, doing some other behaviors. Uh, we are also applying uh, deep learning algorithm to our data set. And this is one example of uh, using uh, long short term memory neural networks. And compared to uh, regular machine learning algorithm like logistic regression of support vector machine, we found that the LSDM model can um, give us much better performance in predicting mood and stress. So we are also working on um, a clinical data set as well, such as uh, symptom prediction for schizophrenia patient. So this is a project um, with some other universities. And so we are here, we are only using the data from mobile phone. However, mobile phone can give us a lot of information. For example, acceleration, like physical activity, app usage, phone call SMS, also um, some privacy sensitive audio information about like audio energy or um, some frequency peaks, number of peaks of uh, frequency domain of audio, like ambient audio. And using this kind of information, we are trying to predict symptoms as well as relapse events. And the, the challenge here is schizophrenia patient has a very heterogeneous characteristics. That means each person might have a different symptoms and their symptoms might be changing over time. So we are also working on some projects for office workers, so people like working at office space. And our purpose is to improve like mood and productivity. And I want to introduce one of the projects we conducted a few years ago about email usage. And I think everyone here is using email every day. And people might be curious, uh, how do our patterns of email usage affect uh, our stress and productivity at work? And so we, studied, we conducted this study in a the company, IT company in the States. And so we, f we analyzed how people use email. And we found the three types of people. One is like this butcher uh, who batches uh, checking emails. So that means checking emails only a few times a day. And the other type is this consistent. So this is the people who always check in emails. And we also found some mixed people. So how many people are like butter here? And how many people are consistent? Okay, maybe 50 and 50. And can you imagine the, what kind of results we get from this study? So the results we got is if you use longer time on checking emails, you have lower productivity and higher stress. And people, people might be checking emails using some notification service. And so, so if people just check emails by themselves without using notification service, they, have, uh, they reported higher productivity. Also, they spend longer time um, on checking emails compared to people who rely on notifications. And the last finding was about batching versus consistent. And batching the email was associated with higher rated productivity with longer email duration. However, we couldn't find any relationship between batching and stress. Does this finding uh, match what you're feeling? Or? So in addition to understanding how people are, you know, how people are behaving at workplace, 
we are also developing some intervention tools. That means we want to reduce people's stress and improve people's uh, productivity. So, so this is an app that gives you uh, some micro intervention. That's, this is a like, micro suggestion so that we, we might be able to help you to improve your productivity or reduce stress. And we are developing this to, um, to provide personalized suggestion and also trying to predict the good timing for delivering this kind of uh, intervention to predict, uh, to obtain the most effective intervention uh, outcomes. So, so far I talked about like, predicting what people will be feeling in the future, also trying to develop some intervention system to reduce people's stress or improve productivity. So now we are trying to connect these pieces together because what we want to do eventually, ultimately, is we want to sense people using uh, sensors or uh, devices, mobile devices, or any kind of sensors in our surroundings. And we want to do some inference of uh, human feeding or health conditions. And we want to provide some intervention to users. So this is the one of the new projects we just started in September uh, with some other universities as well. And we are going to develop some technologies to improve intelligent cognitive, uh, uh, intelligent cognitive um, ability for shift workers. And why shift workers? And sh so all of us have a biological clock in our body. So that is regulating our all kind of rhythms, like heart rate, blood pressure, sleep wake rhythm. And if we travel abroad, you know, everyone experiences jet lag. That is because our biological clock is dis disrupted. However, shift workers, they are shifting their work schedule like, from day to night pretty often. So they feel like they are always jet lag, even though they are staying at the same time zone all the time. So in this project, we are developing this technology to help this kind of people. Shift workers, include, including like medical professionals, firefighters, like people working at plant and factories, uh, etc. So in this project, as I mentioned, uh, we are combining three pieces of technologies, like sensing and inference and intervention. So for sensing, uh, we're going to use mobile sensors and wearable sensors. Also, we are using non-contact sensing technology, which means without wearing anything, without holding anything, we, we can use, for example, camera or radars to measure our physiological signals like heart rate, respiration rate, and activity. So we are combining these three pieces to, uh, to get as continuous uh, as possible um, data. And using that data set, we will infer people's conditions, such as uh, what kind of circadian rhythm condition each person has. Also, we are um, detecting, also predicting like alertness, fatigue, and sleepiness, and stress level. And based on the inferred results, we are giving some intervention to shift workers. That includes, so we're going to provide some light intervention, because light is the most influential a factor for our biological clock. We are also giving uh, some physiological, biological feedback, as well as uh, small actionable uh, behavioral suggestions. And we just kicked off this project in this uh, September, and this is a three-year project. And eventually, at year three, we, we're going to uh, validate our technology at Texas Medical Center for Medical Professionals. So uh, this is um, almost at the end of my talk. And so we, I'm really interested in designing uh, the technology to improve our health and well-being, and especially like personalized adaptive feedback loop system. And I talked about a lot of the like, human data today. But in our research, our research needs other kind of technology as well, not only data analytics, modeling, but also we are in working on like sensing part. Also, we are in uh, working on like human-computer interaction because we are developing technology for human. 
And with that, I'd like to conclude my talk, and I'd like to thank my a lot of collaborators that makes our project possible. Thank you very much. So we have time for a couple of questions. While you're thinking about your question, so in in, in the, we'll get a microphone back to you. So while you're uh, while you're waiting for that, so are are your lab involved in also building sensors, or are you partnering with other institutions to build sensors? And you're talking about more the analysis and the kinds of sensors and data you would want. So uh, yeah, recently I'm for my PhD, I was focusing on data analysis and uh, modeling, but I'm originally from uh, applied physics and uh, electrical engineering background, so I'm interested in, I have been also working on developing wearable sensor itself. So, but in the recent project, I've been collaborating with many different uh, researchers in the States, and especially, yeah, because a lot of people are working on this kind of problem together. So, yeah, we are collaborating. Hi, question back there. Great talk. Um, I was wondering um, how to initially cluster a new user uh, and pick a model with the best feature to describe this person's behavior. And also, do this feature change with time? Yes. Uh, I think adapting to our new user is uh, yeah, one of the challenging issues in our, our research as well. And for example, you know, we can um, when we have a data coming from new user, we can look at some demographic information for the, for the user to find uh, whether that participant, that, that new per user might have uh, some similar characteristics of um, the previous users. We already have the data and the, the, the train that model with. And um, also, there are another issue, another, uh, another things we can, for example, we can re-adapt our pre-trained model to new users um, while we are receiving some of the new users' data. And then for another question was about, uh, sorry, what was the last? Oh, the, the, yes, the features can be changing. Yes, I think so. So I think, for example, if we think about this kind of real-time system, not like feedback loop system, so we, we will be able to like, update the models. Of course, the training the model is time consuming and, yeah, and cost computation, but sometimes, sometimes we need to re-update the model so that we can adapt to um, this dynamics of people's uh, behaviors, I think. Okay, we have one more question back there. I'm gonna be a last one. Hi, uh, Professor Son. I'm very interested in your project, and uh, because I'm not very mentally healthy, and uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm, I could you share about uh, more in details about your source data? Because you said that you have uh, form data and other message data. This, uh, about the form data, do you only use the duration of the time of the phone call, or you also explore the content of the form, or and the same as the message. And if I'm going to use the software, will I be like uh, supervised by the support software so that there is no privacy? <laughs> yes, uh, of course we do very care about uh, privacy issues. And so in our study, we are not looking at the, the contextual data. So we are not looking at conversation or we are not looking at actual message of uh, like SMS or email. So we only use some uh, metadata, like timestamps, also uh, who, who they are connected with. So I understand that a lot of people, of course, we, I also uh, care about this kind of privacy issue. So yes, then our study is, of course, uh, like IRB reviewed, and we always get consent from our participant. Um, am I answering your question? No. So please join me in thanking Akani.